For those of you that don't know me, I see some new faces. My name's Karen Kiefer, and I'm Associate Director at the Church in the 21st Century Center here at Boston College. And um, most of you probably know that our center serves to be a catalyst for the renewal of the Catholic Church. So we like to think that we begin that transformation with conversation, and a lot of our programs are conversation-based and theme-based. Um, many of you know that this semester our theme is the Eucharist at the center, center of Catholic life, and so we've built a number of programs around that particular theme. And as we get into November, our, um, we have, let's see, four programs left, and um, we're really excited about them and really excited to have Dr. Ralph here tonight. Um, I did want to do just a few um, promotional uh, pubbing for a couple of events that are coming up. One is tomorrow. We're having a symposium on Catholic life based on a survey that was just released by National Catholic Reporter. We have copies of the National Catholic Reporter survey at the, at the back table. Um, we have a distinguished panel that will be with us tomorrow from 9 to 3. Um, and it's an open symposium, so you can basically come and, and spend an hour or a couple of hours or the whole day um, with us. There's also a program in the back um, on the table, so you can take a look at exactly how the day is going to unfold. Um, we're getting a lot of uh, press on this, and you'll hear a lot uh, tomorrow coming out in the Globe and also in WBZ Radio. Um, so if you're, if you're interested and you want to just show up, you're welcome. Um, that said, I also wanted to let you know that um, we do have prominent philosopher Charles Taylor coming to speak on November 10th, and he is going to speak about um, keeping the Catholic intellectual tradition alive on university campuses. And it's an interview format, which is very different for the C21 Center, and he'll be interviewed by Father Robert and Belly. So that should be fascinating. Again, that's November 10th. Um, I also wanted to let you know that we do have copies of our magazine, um, The Eucharist at the Center of Catholic Life, at the back on the table, too. Um, again, they're free, and they come out twice a year. Our next magazine is um, actually going to press in December. It's Catholics, a Sacramental People. And last but not least, we are very proud of the fact that we just launched uh, a C21 iPhone app. So if any of you have an iPhone or a smartphone, we have a mobile website for the app. And um, we've been getting rave reviews from younger Catholics, which is great because it definitely answers or actually addresses one of our focal points for the center, which is handing on the faith. So um, if you have a smartphone or an iPhone, it's free. Um, again, um, thank you so much for spending an hour with us tonight. Um, I'd like to introduce one of my colleagues and one of the one of my favorite people to partner with, uh, Melinda Donovan, who is the Associate Director for Continuing Education at the School of Theology and Ministry. And she will introduce our guest speaker this evening. Thank you. Thank you, Karen. And good evening, everyone. I met Margaret, Ralph Nutt, Margaret Nutting Ralph excuse me, this past May at a national catechetical conference where we were each representing our respective institutions. When she started telling me about her work, I was struck by two things. First, she worked with Catholic students at a predominantly non-Catholic seminary, quite different from the School of Theology and Ministry here at Boston College. And second, she mentioned that she had co-authored this book right here, the 2011 Workbook for Lectors, Gospel Readers, and Proclaimers of the Word. I am a lector in my parish, and I, along with lectors all over the United States and Canada, use this very workbook on a regular basis to prepare the Sunday readings. And here was the co-author of that book right there speaking with me. I felt like I had reconnected with an old friend. So now it gives me great pleasure to introduce Margaret to you. Margaret Nutting Ralph holds a Master of Arts degree in English Literature from the University of Massachusetts and a PhD from the University of Kentucky specializing in medieval Renaissance, and 19th century literature. In 1972, she moved with her husband and four children to Lexington, Kentucky, 
While raising their family, Dr. Ralph taught in the religion department at Lexington Catholic High School and in the English Religious Studies program at the University of Kentucky. She later became involved in diocesan work as consultant for adult faith development for the Diocese of Covington, Kentucky, and as director of RCIA and evangelization for the Diocese of Lexington. For 16 years, she served as secretary of educational ministries for the Diocese of Lexington. In 1988, Dr. Ralph joined the faculty of Lexington Theological Seminary, a school with a strong ecumenical tradition that educates students from a wide array of Christian denominations. There, Dr. Ralph serves as director of the Master of Arts program for Roman Catholic students. For the past 30 years, Dr. Ralph has given numerous presentations on biblical topics to parish, diocesan, state, and national groups throughout the United States and Canada. She has also authored numerous articles and study resources and 13 books, including the bestseller, And God Said What? An Introduction to Literary Forms in the Bible, Breaking Open the Lectionary for Cycles A, B, and C, and most recently, A Walk Through the New Testament, an Introduction for Catholics. Her work has been translated into Italian, Spanish, Portuguese, Korean, and Albanian. Please join me in welcoming Margaret Nutting Ralph. Well, good afternoon. Um, it is a true joy for me to be here, a privilege and an honor. Uh, I didn't know that I had a connection to Boston College, but after I was invited, I discovered that I did. And I, I thought I'd just take a minute or two to tell you about that because I can also introduce you to my field of study. Uh, I don't like to be here under false pretenses. but. Um, in 1971, I lived here in Boston. Uh, at that time, our children were one, three, five, and seven. And my husband was doing a postdoc in community mental health delivery systems at Harvard. And we had a student stipend. I think it was $15,000. But the sum of it was I'd had to stop my studies. We had lived in Northampton, Massachusetts, where I'd been at the University of Massachusetts. And uh, we couldn't afford to do anything. And so um, my husband came home one day, and he said he had had the most wonderful day, that he had had lunch with Elliot Richardson. Um, those of you who are in my generation will remember Elliot Richardson. Uh, he was in the uh, presidential world at that time, a, a pol political person. He said, and then they had their seminar at Harvard. In Harvard, they have crimson rugs. And during the seminars, you drink cream sherry. And the conversation was inspiring. And he'd had a wonderful day. And after he told me this, I burst into tears. And um, if he were telling you the story, he'd say it's only because he's a psychologist that he was sensitive enough to pick up that something <laughs> wasn't quite right, <laughs> but uh, he asked me, is there something wrong? And uh, I said, well, I want you to have this wonderful year, but I am finding it a very difficult year because I've had to stop my studies. Um, everything is new, no long-term friendships. I have no adult company. There's no money to do anything, and I'm simply finding it hard. And he said, well, we have to find a way to make it a wonderful year for you, too. And what he suggested I do was that I write a teacher of mine who had taught me at St. Mary's College, a Dominican priest named Father Thomas Heath. And I have since learned that he's a graduate of Boston College. So uh, Boston College played a big role in my life in that way. Uh, he graduated in 1943. But he said to me, I think you should spend the year writing because 
Boston is full of libraries, and it doesn't cost anything uh, to use them, and I will find someone to read what you write. So he did, and the person he found, I don't know if you'll recognize the name or not, was Naomi Burton Stone, and she was Thomas Merton's literary agent. So you can imagine the privilege of that. For a year, I wrote, 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 and she read everything I wrote and criticized it for me. And then when my husband accepted a job in Lexington, Kentucky, and so we actually had a salary and I could go back to school, I was trying to decide what to go back to school in. Uh, and my husband said, follow your heart, which would mean religious education, not law school. And I asked Naomi Burton Stone if I wanted to be more knowledgeable in the areas in which I'm writing, what would I do? And she said, you should get a PhD in English literature and apply your knowledge of literature to scripture. She said, the reason is that biblical scholars across the board, across denominations, now acknowledge, since 1943, which was the Magna Carta of Catholic biblical scholarship, uh, now acknowledge that the Bible is a library of books of different literary forms, not a book with chapters. And in order to understand the intent of any author, you have to be able to accurately talk about the literary forms and the literary devices which the author has used. And she said that's not what theologians have been taught to do, and that's not what biblical scholars have been taught to do. So the field needs a person with a background in literature. Now, I, this, I hadn't seen this myself at all. I simply took her advice. And it took me a long time because we were still raising four children, so I could only take a course a semester for a long, long time. But I finally got a PhD in English literature all along the way, applying the knowledge to, buy, to the Bible. And that uh, bestseller that you mentioned in God Said What is the first book I wrote after I graduated. I wanted to write about biblical literary forms for my dissertation, but my husband said, the purpose of a dissertation is to complete it. <laughs> Once it's done, you can write anything you want, but don't pick a broad topic. Pick a very, very narrow topic. So for the dissertation, I did New Biblical Criticism in the Synoptic Gospels, but then immediately after that, I wrote a book for a popular audience, and God said what, that introduces the literary forms in the Bible. And that book is still being used as a textbook. So that's, um, I, in my mind, it's the story of providence. Uh, that uh, Father Heath was part of that story of providence. Naomi Burton Stone was part of that story of providence. But it does allow me to introduce you to my field of study. I'm not a theologian, and I'm not a person who can compare the English translation to the Greek and Hebrew translation. But I do bring an area of knowledge that sometimes people in those disciplines don't bring. And so it's one more important aspect to help us more thoroughly understand what inspired biblical authors intended to teach us. Now, um, what I've been invited to do is to speak for 35 minutes. So I'm going to stop and at a quarter or 20 after and open it up for questions. And so if I say something that brings up a question in your mind, um, rather than ask it right the minute it occurs to you, if you simply jot it down, there will be an opportunity for you to, to ask those questions. And what I would like to illustrate for you is not only what scripture has to say about um, Eucharist, but the way scripture probes Eucharist, probes the mystery of Eucharist through a huge variety of literary forms. Now, um, I am of the generation that was educated through the Baltimore Catechism. How many of you were educated through the Baltimore Catechism? Okay. Now, the younger people weren't. I don't mean to be uh, critical of the Baltimore Catechism. It does give us a vocabulary with which to probe mystery. But what I learned about Eucharist as a grade school child didn't mean anything to me 
because it was using Greek categories of thought that demanded abstract concepts that a person doesn't have when they're in grade school. But the question in the Baltimore Catechism was, what is the change of the entire substance of the bread and wine into the body and blood of Christ called? And the answer is, the change of the entire substance of the bread and wine into the body and blood of Christ is called transubstantiation. And I, as a little girl, and those of you who raised your hands as very young children, uh, could recite that. Um, I'm not sure I knew what it meant, <laughs> but I could recite it. It didn't invite critical thinking, and it was doctrinaire, using Greek categories of philosophical thought, not biblical categories of narrative thought. Okay. Now, I, I mean, this is a, a matter of personality, but I much prefer probing this deep mystery through narrative. And I want in, this, in these few minutes that I have with you to give you just a little idea of all the kinds of ways that inspired authors have tried to probe what they knew from experience, and that is that the person of Christ is present in Eucharist. Now, how do they teach that? If I'm going to do it in the order in which the things were written. And so the earliest one is one that you might not immediately think of when you're thinking of this topic, and it's Paul's first letter to the Corinthians. Uh, as you probably know, all of Paul's letters predate any of our present Gospels in the form in which we have them. So the earliest text I can turn to is going to be 1 Corinthians. And in 1 Corinthians, Paul doesn't so much teach that Jesus is present in the Eucharist as he assumes it. That's a given. Everybody knows that. He goes on to talk about, given that, what should also be true. And the presumption that we are uh, in a relationship with the living Christ, with the risen Christ, when we receive Eucharist, he states very clearly in chapter 10, verses 16 to 17, when he says, the blessing cup that we bless is a communion with the blood of Christ, and the bread that we break is a communion with the body of Christ. The fact that there is only one loaf means that, though there are many of us, we form a single body because we all have a share in this one loaf. So he's reminding them that Christ is present here and that through receiving the body of Christ, we become the body of Christ. St. Augustine is the one who usually gets credit for that insight. We, we, we become what we receive. But Paul says exactly the same thing. And then as he goes on, he's talking more about the ramifications of our receiving Eucharist and the fact that because Christ is present and we become the body of Christ, we are one body. And he's angry when he writes this letter because the Corinthians who were celebrating Eucharist at meals, they'd gather for meals, were eating too much and drinking too much and ignoring the needs of the poor. And he thinks it is outrageous that of all places on earth, the place where there should be obvious division and neglect of part of the body of Christ would be Eucharist. For Paul, that meant it isn't Eucharist. If you're ignoring the poor and acting in a divisive way, that is not what Eucharist is about. Eucharist is about unity and being in relationship with Jesus Christ. And so Paul says, now I am on the subject of instructions. I cannot say that you have done well in holding meetings, that you do more harm than good. 
In the first place, I hear that when you all come together as a community, there are separate factions among you, and I half believe it, since there must no doubt be separate groups among you to distinguish those who are to be trusted. The point is, when you hold these meetings, it's not the Lord's Supper that you're eating, since when the time comes to eat, everyone is in such a hurry to start his own supper that one person goes hungry while another is getting drunk. Surely you have homes for eating and drinking. Surely you have enough respect for the community of God not to make poor people embarrassed. What am I to say to you? Congratulate you? I cannot congratulate you on this. For this is what I received from the Lord, and in turn passed on to you, that on the same night that he was betrayed, the Lord Jesus took some bread and thanked God for it and broke it. And he said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this as a, rem as a memorial of me. In the same way, he took the cup after supper and said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Whenever you drink it, do this as a memorial of me. Until the Lord comes, therefore, every time you eat this bread and drink this cup, you are proclaiming his death. And so anyone who eats the bread and drinks the cup of the Lord unworthily will be behaving unworthily toward the body and blood of the Lord. Everyone is to recollect himself before eating this bread and drinking this cup, because a person who eats and drinks without recognizing the body is eating and drinking his own condemnation. Now, very often, um, Melanie mentioned that I work in ecumenical settings. Uh, very often in Catholic settings, when they hear that without recognizing the body, they hear it as not recognizing transubstantiation. <laughs> okay. But I think in the context in which Paul's saying it, he's saying that they're failing to recognize the body of Christ, meaning those who have received Eucharist are one with Christ, are poor, and are being ignored by their fellow Christians. So Paul is talking about the ramifications of being a Eucharistic community and that we aren't being faithful to our mission if we act in divisive manners and fail to recognize the needs of the poor. Now, uh, since I work in ecumenical settings and scripture is a living word, one of the things I'd find is an interesting uh, part of our discussion in just a few minutes is what does that mean in an ecumenical setting? Because today, too, Eucharist has become a sign of division, not a sign of unity. Even though we recognize the baptism of other Christians and acknowledge that they, too, are members of the body of Christ. Now, all three synoptic gospels picture Jesus at the last meal that he has before he dies, celebrating the Passover meal and reinterpreting the bread and the wine of that meal in such a way that he institutes Eucharist. And when we think of biblical passages that would confirm our belief about Eucharist, we most often turn directly to those passages. Now those are, that is in Mark, it's in Matthew, and it's in Luke. It's not in John. And I'll talk about John a little bit later, but in John, Jesus is killed at the time the Passover lambs are being killed for the Passover meal. So the Passover is the meal after Jesus' crucifixion, not the meal before Jesus' crucifixion. I'll talk about that when we get there. But in three Gospels, uh, Jesus is pictured as at the Passover new meal. Now remember, this is in a way one witness because Mark was a source for both Matthew and Luke. I'm going to turn to Luke because Luke emphasizes Eucharist more than the other two synoptic Gospels do because he adds a story at the end the disciples on the road to Emmaus that reteaches Eucharist, which is not in the others. And he includes a midrash, and I'll explain what that means in case you haven't um, run across that word before, in his birth narrative, 
that also teaches that Jesus is food for the flock. So let's look at the passages that are in Luke. Um, the institution of the Eucharist in Luke is in chapter 22, and I want to read it to you because one of the things you do when you study the Bible as literature is you read a book at a time. So an earlier passage casts light on a later passage. And one of the things that I think is true of many Catholics is that they haven't read a book at a time. Their familiarity with scripture is from the lectionary and not from the Bible. And so if I were to ask, uh, only one gospel has this story, which gospel is it? Most Catholics would find that very difficult to answer because in their minds they have meshed it all into one story. And so they don't have each gospel as an individual book where one element reflects a later element and an author might be saying something that another author hasn't said. So when Luke pictures Jesus instituting the Eucharist, and I'm going to read you Luke 22, 14 to 20, he says this. When the hour came, he took his place at table and the apostles with him, and he said to them, I have longed to eat this Passover with you before I suffer, because I tell you, I shall not eat it again until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. Okay, so Jesus is talking about not eating with them again until what he has come to do is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. Then taking a cup, he gave thanks and said, take, take this and share it among you, because from now on I tell you I shall not drink wine until the kingdom of God comes. Then he took some bread, and when he had given thanks, broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which will be given for you. Do this as a memorial of me. He did the same with the cup after supper and said, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which will be poured out for you. Now, the fact that that passage exists casts light on the story that comes just two chapters later, which is a post-resurrection appearance story. And this story appears only in Luke. Now, you're familiar with the story. I'm not going to take time to read the whole thing to you. But you remember that the two disciples are walking along and talking about Jesus. When Jesus joins them, as a stranger. They spend the whole day with him and don't recognize that it is the risen Christ who is in their presence. And Christ reinterprets scripture for them in the light of his own passion, death, and resurrection. Do you remember this? So the story, by the time we get to the part I'm going to um, read to you, the story has already taught us that the risen Christ is present where two are gathered in his name. The risen Christ is present in the stranger on the road, the fellow pilgrim through life. And then it says this, and I'm going to read 24, 28 to 32. When they drew near to the village to which they were going, he made as if to go on, but they pressed him to stay with them. It is nearly evening, they said, and the day is almost over. So he went in to stay with them. Now while he was with them at table, he took the bread and said the blessing. Then he broke it and handed it to them. Can you hear that's an allusion to the previous story? It's repeating exactly the same words. So we're supposed to connect the institution of Eucharist with this story. And their eyes were opened and they recognized him, but he had vanished from their sight. Then they said to each other, did not our hearts burn within us as, we talked, as he talked to us on the road and explained the scripture to us? Now, as Catholics, we believe that Christ is present in our gathered community. We believe that Christ is present in the word. We believe that Christ is present in the Eucharist. Isn't that right? 
And this story is teaching us all of that. But because of what Jesus said at the Last Supper in Luke, and because this story appears just a couple of chapters later, this brings in another aspect to Eucharist that we celebrate every Mass. And that is that when we are celebrating Eucharist, we are stepping outside of time and space and celebrating an eschatological meal. Do you remember Jesus said at the institution of the Eucharist that he would not be eating with them again until the kingdom had been fulfilled in terms of his um, suffering and death? Okay, and here he is eating with them again. And I think this is All Souls Day, tomorrow's All Saints Day. This is an extremely important thing to remember, that just as we are not separated from the risen Christ, we are not separated from our beloved relatives and friends who have preceded us in following Christ through death to new life. I heard this stated very succinctly once by um, a priest evangelist who said, Christ definitely comes to Eucharist, but he doesn't come late and he doesn't come alone. I think both of those things are true. He doesn't come late, he doesn't come alone. So Luke teaches us the eschatological nature of Eucharist. Now, if you've never studied birth narratives, what I'm going to say now might upset you. So I just want to say that and say if it does, Please ask questions, and please read further. Um, because an infancy narrative is a distinct literary form. And if I hadn't studied this in an academic setting, I don't know that I would know what I'm going to say now. So it might not be general knowledge. But the function of a birth narrative is not to describe events as exactly as they occurred. In other words, it's not responding to the question, tell me what happened. It's responding to the question, tell me how great this person became, as you know from hindsight. The birth narratives were the latest to develop of the kinds of material that appear in our edited synoptic gospels. And as you notice, Mark doesn't have any. Only Matthew and Luke have birth narratives. And while each of them agree on the core history of who was the father, who was the mother, uh, of what country, what time in history. When we get down to the details of the story, Mark's, um, Matthew's account and Luke's account are very different. In other words, only Matthew has the star and the wise men and the massacre of the innocents and the flight to Egypt. Only Luke has the manger, the shepherds, so what scripture scholars do is they ask, what is the author trying to teach by telling the story this way? And the word that is used for the literary device used here is midrash. And this is a literary device. Okay. In midrash, an author in telling a basic story that has a historical core weaves around that story plot elements that are allusions to Old Testament texts that teach the significance of this person's birth as it was known in hindsight. Okay. Now, only Luke has this beautiful scene where 
Mary takes her firstborn, wraps him in swaddling clothes, and places him in a manger. Do you remember that? And then an angel announces to the shepherds that a savior has been born and that they will recognize him when they see this sign that he is in a manger. Do you remember that? And then the shepherds rush to the manger and they see the sign they were told they would see and they rejoice and praise God because they recognize the meaning of the sign. Okay. Now with that little introduction, let me read you the text so you know that I'm not making it up. I'm often accused of making things up. So I have to support what I say with evidence from the text. I'm going to read you 2, 7 to 20. She wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them at the inn. In the countryside close by, there were shepherds who lived in the fields and took it in turns to watch their flocks during the night. The angel of the Lord appeared to them and the glory of the Lord shone round them. They were terrified, but the angel said, do not be afraid, listen. I bring you news of great joy, a joy to be shared by the whole people. Today in the town of David, a savior has been born to you. He is Christ the Lord. And here is a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger. And suddenly, with the angel, there was a great throng of the heavenly host praising God and singing, Glory to God in the highest heaven and peace to men who enjoy his favor. Remember, we just talked about Eucharist as an eschatological meal that joins heaven and earth. Okay. Now when the angels had gone from them into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let us go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has made known to us. So they hurried away and found Mary and Joseph and the baby lying in the manger. Do you see how the manger is being emphasized? It's named three times. Okay. When they saw the child, they repeated what they had been told about him, and everyone who heard it was astonished at what the shepherds had to say. As for Mary, she treasured all these things and pondered them in her heart. And the shepherds went back, glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen. It was exactly as they had been told. Okay, now that is a midrash that is teaching that in Christ's birth, the situation which is deplored by God as the book of Isaiah begins has now been reversed. Isaiah begins like this. Listen, you heavens, earth attend, for Yahweh is speaking. I reared sons, I brought them up, but they have rebelled against me. The ox knows its owner, the ass its master's crib. Israel knows nothing, my people understand nothing. So what we have here is a situation in which the shepherds recognize who this infant is. And he's placed in the manger because the manger is where you put the food for the flock. It's a feeding trough. So Luke teaches that Jesus is present in Eucharist and feeds the flock, both in his infancy narrative, in his Last Supper narrative, and in his post-resurrection narrative. Now, we're almost out of time, so I'm just going to name what John does. I won't illustrate it all by reading the text, but I'll just name it so you get an idea of how different John is. John has no infancy narrative. He has no story of the two disciples on the road to Emmaus. He has no Passover Last Supper where Jesus institutes Eucharist. But he emphasizes Eucharist just as much as Luke. And he does it by having allegorical stories that appear to be about Jesus' public ministry, 
but in fact are about the presence of the risen Christ in the community to whom John is writing, which is the end of the century community who is asking, where is the risen Christ? He was supposed to return in glory long before now. And you know that expectation that Jesus would return in the generation of the people who witnessed his death was is obvious in the letters, in Paul's letters, in the Synoptic Gospels. Okay. So where is he? John is writing his gospel to teach that the risen Christ did return. He returned in his post-resurrection appearances, and he has never left. He remains with his people through the church and through the sacraments. And so the mighty signs in John's gospel are allegories about the ways in which the risen Christ is present. So through the allegory of the feeding of the multitude, he has Jesus feed the flock. And then through Jesus' I am the bread of life speech, he has Jesus claim that my flesh is real food, my blood is real drink, and he who eats my flesh and drinks my blood will have eternal life. Those are all Eucharistic passages. And while he does that as a center, he also uh, emphasizes both the sacrament of baptism and the sacrament of Eucharist at the beginning of Christ's public ministry and at the end of Christ's public ministry. He does it at the beginning of Christ's public ministry at the wedding feast at Cana when empty ablution jars, which represent the law and the old way of being in right relationship with God, are filled with water that becomes wine. That represents baptism and Eucharist. And at the end of Jesus' public ministry, only in John, the soldier pierces his side and out comes water and blood. That too represents Baptist and Eucharist. So all of our inspired authors emphasize Eucharist. And they teach us not only that Christ is truly present in Eucharist, but they teach us the ramifications of our receiving Christ in Eucharist. We become the body of Christ. And we have the responsibility to recognize Christ in all the places where Christ is truly present. And we have the responsibility of continuing Christ's mission to the world.